Hello, I'm Randall Pinkston. Thank you for viewing Raising Liberty Square, and thank you for joining us for a discussion of the documentary with two people who have been intimately involved in the making of the film, as well as living for years, decades, dare we say, in Liberty Square. Let me introduce you now to our guests who are joining us. Um, Ann Bennett is the director of- uh, uh, Producer. Producer, sorry. Producer uh, of Liberty Square um, and lives in New York, but uh, has a an interest in several aspects of the film, which we'll get to um, uh, in, in a minute. And Anna Williams grew up in Liberty Square Projects with her family living there for some 30 years, I think, Miss Williams. Is that about That's right? That's correct. 30 years. Uh, she has been, shall we say, a one-person watchdog from the beginning of the inception of the concept of um, replacing the old buildings with the new buildings and the displacement of some of its residents. Uh, and, and I will apologize to the mayor because they insist that no one was displaced, but I'll let Miss Williams tell us more about that. Later. But as I watch the film, um, and I'll, I'll give this question to you, uh, Miss Bennett, um, it, it seemed to me that it was more about urban, what we used to call urban removal than it was about climate change. Mm -hmm. So, and, and in the film itself, there wasn't a lot of of discussion about climate. I mean, a little bit, but not much. Mm -hmm. So please help our audience understand the nexus, the connection between climate change mm -hmm. and uh, the phenomenon that was witnessed with um, Liberty Square. Uh, yes, thank you. That's a great question. Um, uh, and thank you for, for inviting us to participate in the, uh, the TNEC um, International Film Festival. Um, for this project, um, we uh, were, wanted to tell a story of this neighborhood in Miami that was in the process, in the midst of going through a really radical change of um, the, the residents, of the architecture, of the whole the whole essence of that community. Um, and we um, sort of refer to this film as um, a, some, a story around climate gentrification, but really uh, what we want to get at is that this is truly an intersectional story where we are looking at that intersection of um, housing and, and how people can lose housing and lose their housing security. Um, it's a story about what, how um, neighborhoods that are disenfranchised, um, that are ignored, um, that are pushed around, you know, generationally, how that affects um, individual um, families and then generational um, families. And then also we um, found that as we started to talk to our, our family members, the people who lived on the ground and people like Ms. Anna Williams here, um, we found that, um, yes, this is a story about housing. Yes, it's a story about um, um, some you know, inequities of, 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 our, um, of our systems here. Um, but a lot of this was um, triggered by the climate crisis. And that is how in Miami, in many coastal cities, but specifically in Miami, that sea level rise is a real thing. That sea level rise um, and the climate crisis were affecting the coastal areas where, and these same coastal areas um, had originally been settled by uh, some large Black communities, and then Black folks were sort of pushed out into the, the center um, of the city, um, away from the coastal areas, because those coastal areas were developed as very profitable um, resort areas, uh, resort communities, and um, and uh, residential properties, etc. Um, and so, as climate change becomes a larger feature through um, hurricanes, through uh, what they call, um, uh, Anna can talk more about sort of these um, sunshine flooding, where um, it could be a beautiful sunny day, but still there's water in the streets from the aquifer, from water seeping in. And then also with the, the, the sea level rise starting to encroach 
on Miami, that is one of the triggers for the gentrification, right? So um, yes, we're talking about housing. Yes, we're talking about social issues, but this cycle of change is triggered or prompted by environmental issues. Um, and as far as how that affects the residents, the people, um, Anna, as a lifelong resident of South Florida, can give you a sense of um, how this affects uh, people on the ground in this community. Well, before um, we get to that point, Ms. Williams, what I would like to begin with is for your initial impression, uh, not what it turned out to be as you watch this, this project get off the ground and, 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 and get built. But when you first heard about the $300 million redevelopment plan uh, that the city of Miami was going to sponsor in your own neighborhood, what was your first impression? Believe it or not, I was ecstatic, excited, hmm. turned on. Because uh, as Ann uh, said, I spent all of my, my youth and college years in Liberty Square housing project. Mm -hmm. I, I did not ex exit the project until after I completed college and worked my first year uh, at a prominent uh, utilities company in Miami, Florida. And after that first year, they came to my home where I resided with my mom and dad and told me, look, either she goes or your family have, has to leave because I started making money, you know? So there's an income level, you know, certain income level. So oh, I, can, I, can I, I just, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm curious. Do you recall how, because all of Liberty Square was public housing for uh, people with, with low, with low incomes. Right. Able to pay market rent. Right. Federally funded public funded, housing. Yes, exactly. Right. But managed mm -hmm. by the city by that point. By by the city uh -huh. or the county, right? The county. county. Mm -hmm. So how much how much was the rent uh, that your parents had to pay at that point at that time? It's a couple of hundred dollars a mm -hmm. month, and then the uh, electric. There was no water bill. Mm -hmm. uh, the electric bill, all of that was subsidized. So it, it, I and I was fortunate enough where mom and dad were in the home. Mom didn't work. There were eight kids. And I was the oldest of eight. And mom did not work until after the youngest got into junior high school. My dad was a custodian at a local high school at night. And in the daytime, he was a handyman. He did his little odd jobs and whatever. And uh, uh, I was the first generation of my parents both came from the Bahamas and the British West Indies. Dad was from the British West Indies, Turks and Caicos. And mom was from a little tiny island in the Bahamas. So here they are. They, they're they in Miami and they met and they married and they raised their family. And from the old Overtown area, which urban removal. And when that started, they pushed us Push the family into Liberty Square. Okay. okay. And that's how we got there. And when we got the news, it, it started out, um, Randall, when we grew up as uh, uh, children there, it was fantastic. Folks took care of their yards. The units were maintained by the county. The unit, Liberty Square had its own maintenance force. Hmm. provided by the county they would come by if you had a screen a broken door ba bad plumbing or whatever we didn't have to fool with any of that stuff all we had to do is make a call to what we call the rent office which is the community center and you've been there and that's where all we w walked to the community center paid our rent Mom didn't have a bank account or anything. We paid, got a money order, Randall. You paid your rent there, filed your complaint, and each year you would come and do your reevaluation for staying in the community. And it was perfect until the 60s, and then all hell broke loose. 
what happened the then? 60s, with the 60s, with the drugs and hmm. the gangs, and in the 80s, the riots, and the community was never the same. Let me let me ask you something. In the sixties, uh, when the as you put it, the drugs and the gangs began, whatever happened to that infrastructure that had been so great with maintaining the um, the buildings and the community and the grounds? What what happened to that so, infrastructure? What I believe, Randall, and I and and this is just uh, my opinion: the political environment of Miami-Dade County changed tremendously, tremendously. It was no longer uh, money came in, but money did not get to us in the community. Oh, right. So, and yeah, Anna, and what time, uh, What about what time did, did the highway, it was at 95 that had gone through? That's in Overtown. That's the right. original Randall back in the day. They packed all uh, any uh, Bahamians that came in, um, uh, West Indies, any of those uh, minority communities, all of us were housed in Overtown, in these little clapboard houses, tiny alleys, uh, no indoor plumbing. So you came in, uh, my parents came in, and they had an aunt that had a, a little house uh, on 14th Street, and that's where my mom stayed until she met my dad. And, that's, and then from uh, Overtown, all of a sudden, that community became desirable because because it was near the beaches. They had they were renovating downtown Miami with all these fabulous hotels and resorts and going over the bridge to Miami Beach. And uh, as uh, and indicated the. They drove I ninety five right through the middle of, of of our community, so we had to like exit. I mean, right through the middle of the residential community where most of us resided. And, and uh, I'm sorry uh, to, to, inter to interrupt you, Miss Williams, but Miss Bennett. So what you're saying is that that I ninety five corridor, which by the way, I lived in Jacksonville for uh, a few years, and yeah. uh, that community was also uh, decimated by uh the construction of the interstate not just those two communities but all of all over the country almost yes. as if the the, the 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 people who were building the roads and this is my speculation i will do that I, <laughs> like they looked for places where people of color were residing to to put to build the roads even if the community was just intact and very lovely and very nice um, and certainly that happened in Jacksonville and obviously it happened in, in Miami as well. So, but Ms. Bender, you see that as one of the precursors to the, the real estate displacement um, that that we witnessed in this in this documentary. Oh, most definitely. And and as Anna mentioned, when she grew up, when she was young, um, there it was, you know, the they had that these beautiful bungalows that had been built mm -hmm. in the 30s, um, it was well maintained. But once um uh I mean there there are many factors that were going on. Um, but um with the um with the, the construction um of the, the highway, um uh that black neighborhood, as Anna mentioned, was um was literally just, just raised to the ground. Um, and so Black folks were forced inland. Um, and the closest inland um, was um, community for them to go to was Liberty Square. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and in addition to that original Liberty Square um, housing development that had been built in the 30s, there were new developments as well that weren't these beautiful little bungalows, but were you know, less well constructed and, you know, more, you know, more concentrated. Um, and, um, and that's when I, I, again, Anna can, can give us uh, more details when you know, the services began to diminish and there are more people, but fewer services. Right. Um, and so the, the neighborhood just started to, to suffer. Um, and there was literally this dis dis disenfranchisement. And, and I don't know, this is what, 
um, you know, I don't know all of the politics of the city, but also when uh, Liberty Square was founded, um, it was on, um, how do they uh, call it, um, Anna, uh, uh, dis, um, non-incorporated territory, right? right? Yeah. Right. So they did not have representatives, you know, exactly. mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, as, as an unincorporated district. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they literally had people who were um, were you know, on the margins, uh, not only because of their status, you know, ethnically or racially or, or economically, but also because they literally did not have a vote. Right? That's um, right. And so that affected um, their their power um, and their lack thereof and the, the uh, disinvestment that followed and grew and just sort of snowballed um, into a state where uh, it was a very difficult place to live. And, and, and Anna can tell you more about, um, you know, how things were in the 60s and 70s and the 80s um, as to, you know, when uh, the neighborhood and the city was really changing. And that's where, you know, the, the riots happened and, and the city was even more, that area of the city was even more challenged. The, um, the documentary mentioned something, what, I have seen referred to in Baltimore as a spite wall, a wall that um, oh my goodness. Caucasian residents built uh, to separate their communities from uh, the communities of people of color. Would you, would you care to tell me what you remember about that, Ms. Williams? Randall, you can visit Liberty Square Housing Project. It's a it's not a, a huge community. There were just 700 units built there. Remnants of that wall is still there today. Across the street from the elementary school where I attended back in the 60s. I started first grade there in 1960. And we had to jump the wall through our little backpacks, our little lunches, across the wall to get on the other side to where our school was. We took a shortcut through there rather than walk all the way down the length of the wall and then come back up uh, uh, to cross over at the light. You would see kids, Randall, in the neighborhood jumping the wall, Black kids. To get to 12th Avenue, to walk up 12th Avenue, to get to school in the morning. And remnants of that wall is still there. They never took it down. The, the, uh, and the wall on the, to the west was Liberty Square Housing Project. And east of that wall were white residents in their homes. And, nice homes. And, and they... And they authorized that. They allowed it. The wall was actually higher when we were growing up. Hmm. After, uh, let's say around, and because I was in high school in the 70s, uh, 80s, the riots. After the riot, they sort of like carved the wall down, down, I say downsize the wall, and <laughs> they downsized the wall, but it's still there. Hmm. And well, it's, me, right. It's unbelievable in Miami. Yeah. And and especially, yeah, you know, it's um, you know, thank you, Anna. That's uh -huh. that's so true. And I'll I, I mean I'm I I'm I uh um my family's from from Baltimore, but I, I grew up in Boston. Um and um, I didn't know my in Miami really much at at, at all, um, but I always thought of it as this international city, this resort city. Um, but Miami, Florida, is in the South. You know, it is ruled by at that time. It was ruled by Jim Crow racial segregation, exactly. mm -hmm. and that was the law of the land. It wasn't just the practice; that was the law of the land, where the city was segregated by race. So uh, I mentioned the spite wall that I first learned about a few years ago doing a documentary for Morgan State University. Mm -hmm. Morgan State's current campus was um, purchased mm, early part of the 20th century by the Methodist Church, and the first presidents were, were, were Caucasian. So they were able to purchase the land 
but the surrounding neighbors didn't know that the school they were going to put there was for Negroes. <laughs> And when they learned it, um, there was a hue and cry. There were efforts to pass laws to, to, to move the school. And, and eventually, they built a wall known as the Spite Wall. And I'm told that in the 30s, I think it was, maybe the 20s, Germany, Germans, Nazi Germans came over to the U.S. to study segregation in Baltimore to figure out how they were going to impose racial ethnic restrictions against Jews in Germany. That was, mm -hmm. I, I never dreamed that the Germans would have learned something so heinous from America, but they did. And we know the, the rest of that's a whole other story. Uh, but let me get back uh, to, so now, uh, Ms. Williams, you start out being very enthusiastic about this three hundred million dollar proposal. At what point? How many years into the the movement towards uh, uh, the, the the redevelopment did you begin to become suspicious about uh, motives? Let's say in in the beginning, those famous words in the Bible. In the beginning, in the happy, happy, joy, joy. Uh, after I. Uh, finished college, retired, and uh, decided to come back, give back to my community. I volunteered at Holmes Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that was my door back into the community at um, Liberty Square, because all of, the, all of the kids in Liberty Square attended, the majority of them attended Holmes Elementary School. So there I did a uh, uh, tutoring and reading and what have you. So when this money came in, a lot of the fam, my fam, the children that I mentored, I took their parents under my wings to help them get through this process. So there was a series of meetings every month which the county and the developer lined up community stakeholders uh, to assist the residents with uh, uh, the developer and the county's plan on this new development to sell us on that, Randall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we met every month. There were uh, police chiefs. There were mental health specialists. There were uh, health care uh, directors, everyone was at the table. Uh, well, I've seen, so I've seen uh, if, in the in the film it, it shows the director of uh, the the development as well as uh, Aaron, uh, the brother who was right, who he thought is, he, yeah, he right, and the and mayor. It was it good. Sounded, it sounded as if they were listening to what the people were saying and responding. Randall, it was working. The residents. It was a beautiful thing. It was working. We had meetings with the mayor, uh, Ben Carson, and uh, er from HUD. Everyone was like, it was a true partnership because I was one of those voices that spoke up and said, what happened in the other project down the street, uh, James E. Scott project, was not going to happen to Liberty Square residents. You weren't going to come in there and pitch a dog and pony show and then scatter my people all over the community, all over Florida, outside. Some of the residents in the outside of Florida and then never to be heard from again. And that happened before. So promises, 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 Randall. And uh, COVID mm. entered the picture, Randall. And when COVID entered the fish picture, Everyone scattered like flies. The meeting you... stopped hand the meeting stopped handling where we were able to ask Aaron, the developer, the county, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? How's this gonna be handled? Scat that the meeting stopped ha uh, happening. The uh of tenant council was of Liberty Square was bought out by the developer, the developer ran the tenant council of Liberty Square. Wait, wait. The te the tenant council is a is a group of quote unquote resident 
a residential board within yeah. Liberty Square. And the developer began to he, he bought out the president of the board where she was no longer invested in the residence, but she got almost a four or five bedroom apartment within the re it, within the development. So you know she was no longer an advocate for us. Well, of course, if she was available, we would ask her questions, but this is a Zoom thing, so we can't. So. We can't do right. that. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let, 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 me, let, let me move over, move uh -huh. over to Ms. Bennett. Um, at, at any point uh, along this uh, path here, Ms. Bennett, as you worked on the film, was it clear to you that the city's aim was anything at all about climate change, anything at all about moving some mm. people to high ground and moving other folks out? W w w did that ever occur? Um, hmm, that's a good question, uh, Randall. Um, I would say that as the as our story progressed, as the filming continued, one thing that we noticed was that um, more and more people would um, who lived uh, both within the Liberty Square development itself and Liberty City, which was the community that grew around Liberty Square, the development, that more and more people were being pressured um, to sell um, their property, to Same sell their home. land. Yeah. And that there were more and more developers who were trying to buy up um, the land in that neighborhood. And it was to the point where it was, you know, sort of a classic example of sort of a predatory um, development where people would get, I won't say threatening, but people would get um, very insistent calls and knocks on the door saying, don't you want to sell? Don't you want to sell? Don't you want to sell? Um, because of buying up all the lots around the area um, to for future development. So, so this, so this, so the Liberty Square development resulted in people of color who had homes outside Liberty Square also being um, persuaded, shall we say, exactly, enticed. Right. Not right. not on, not only um, Randall, not only Liberty City, but there there were other neighboring uh, black communities, uh, Brownsville, and uh, over there they had a fight going on, uh, and there were other surrounding black neighborhoods that the same thing was happening. But in answer to your question, Randall, at the same time they were offering these little box houses. These folks were getting hundreds of thousand dollars offer for these little box houses in the hood. And, but at the same time on Miami beach, every time the high tides came in, Miami beach was flooded. The oceans came up. The sea came up to meet the store owners hmm. on the major thoroughfare of Miami Beach. There downtown, was downtown Miami, mm -hmm. Brickell Avenue, where they pushed us out and built these multi-story buildings at the same time now, these streets were flooded. You couldn't drive through drive on Brickell Avenue when it just a simple rain. It wasn't even a hurricane, Randall. Just a strong rain. Um, in Miami Beach, a few years ago, there was a building collapse. And what yes. is the Lincoln? Yes. And Lincoln Sir Avenue, Sir. Lincoln, uh, from Lincoln. Yes. And uh the and, and there's a whole bunch of buildings that had, had the same kind of construction, yes, and therefore raising the same kind of architectural um integrity concerns. Yes. And so I'm suspecting that when people were living in those particular buildings, they began to look for somewhere else to go. You got it, Toyota. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you got yeah. it. You uh -huh. connected the dots. You okay. did. And okay. at that time, Katya 
was in the community doing her little a historical gentrification version, nicey, nicey. Oh, here, it, here it's happening again, the same way it happened over town in Miami, New York, Chicago, you name it, Baltimore. She's there doing her little con, uh, gentrification story. And then out just the noise in the background with South Beach, Brickell Avenue, Aventure, uh, where the water is just, uh, everybody's complaining. They're buying pumps. What are we going to do there? They're pressuring the county. Uh, mm. you, we need uh, to get this under control. Uh, uh, this this doesn't need to, we pay too, so much money to live out here, to enjoy the ocean views. Mm. All pro away from the quote unquote black neighborhoods, they they could just catch the bus. It used to be a time Randall, where you catch the bus and worked over there uh, in Surfside and those places, Bay, um, Brickle and all of that. But at night, you gotta you go as back. As a black person, you better be off that beach by nightfall. I have to. Uh, 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 sorry to, to interrupt you again, Miss Williams. Fascinating backstory to so all of this, but uh, here in New Jersey. Uh, you you may know that there was this thing called Storm Sandy several years ago. It wasn't even a hurricane. Yes, I was still working as a as a journalist then, and I was uh, covering a location in Lower Manhattan near a ferry uh, landing, which was not too far from Canal Street. Now, for mm -hmm. those who know um, New York City, Canal Street in, is in Lower Manhattan. It's I don't know, maybe a half mile up from the very tip, very bottom of Manhattan. And, um, you know, Canal Street, you you drive across Canal Street uh, to uh, the east side uh, from the west to the east. And we were on the west side that night. Storm Sandy talking about rising sea levels, sea levels. And now we're not near the we, we, we're, we're near the Hudson River, you know, which obviously is near the New York Bay, which is near the sea. So the water was pushing up. Canal Street became a canal again. Water was up to my thighs uh when, when i got off my shift to walk to the hotel mm -hmm. and at a at a point the the, the water tapered off and I, and I was like pause i said what how where did this come from and everybody said it came from where it used to come from before that's why the streets called canal it used to be a canal <laughs> and then we went a few blocks south to what we call the entry of the brooklyn battery tunnel which mm -hmm. is an underground tunnel connecting manhattan to brooklyn brooklyn battery tunnel Water was up halfway into the tunnel. And this was not a hurricane. This was just mm -hmm. a storm. That's right. And so the, uh, the mayor at the time had ordered evacuations, Mayor uh, Bloomberg, had ordered evacuations from all coastal areas. And most people heeded the call and they did move and I think save who knows how many lives were saved because people did listen and, and got out of the way because the water in Staten Island and Brooklyn and Queens if you were anywhere close to the water, you were underwater. Um, so now the climate change. I mean, that's what I'm trying to work my way to. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a very securitist kind of way. Um, so the question I was asking you was whether the, the, the town officials were looking more at this as a way of just getting some good real estate or getting some high ground. So obviously there was it was both. It was both. That's but, what it evolved. And it, that's that's where the light went on. In yeah. the middle of this uh, transitioning process, climate, rising sea level issue came into the picture. I mean, just clear as day, Randall. Because here we are, we're in the middle, and all of a sudden, these people are pushing in, coming in from the east, from the waterways, and they're looking for, you know, a decent place to stay. And most of them are what millenniums. They don't need uh, 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 acreage or whatever in the suburbs or whatever. All they want, they're building these multi-story apartments. And all these kids want to do, just give me a room, a loft or whatever. I'm good. Here's the bus line right there. They built a $2.7 million uh, veterinarian uh, 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 right on the in the heart of Liberty Square, Randall. You go there today. Last uh, year, 
they open a, a, a veterinary to accommodate. Okay, Miss Miss Williams, I'm sorry. Uh, I we, we, we've done it again. We've run out of time, and I've just gotten a signal from my producer who's saying this is a hard break, which means if I don't shut up, we'll be coming. So cut let me off. let me just say thank you, um, and Bennett, Miss Miss Ann Bennett, Miss Anna Williams for participating uh, in the Teenage International Film Festival. Raising Liberty Square will have its broadcast premiere on PBS on January 29th next Monday at 10 p.m. on Channel 13 here in New York. And if wherever you are, check your local listings for the PBS a station near you for Raising Liberty Square. Thank you so very much. I'm Randall Pinkston. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.